Hi there, I'm Brandon Burns, CVP for Azure Resource Manager and DevOps in Azure. Have you been wondering the best way to describe and deploy resources to the Azure Cloud? Well, the modern cloud-native way to do development and deployment of Azure Resources is Infrastructure as Code, or IAC. With Infrastructure as Code, you use a simple text format to describe your resources, and then you can take that description and use it to reliably and repeatedly deploy your application around the world. Now, traditionally, infrastructure as code languages have been a little complicated, hard to learn, and honestly, not that much fun. With BICEP, a new infrastructure as code language from Azure, we've put a real focus on designing a language that's easy to start with, fun to use, and has great tooling in familiar environments like VS Code. Whether you're a beginner in the world of infrastructure as code, or you have a bunch of experience in ARM templates, we invite you to join us on Microsoft Learn Live. There, we're gonna have a series of lessons with subject matter experts on the BICEP team, helping you understand the best way to use BICEP to do infrastructure as code on Azure. Along the way, you'll learn BICEP basics, get to know the tooling in VS Code, and even learn a lot about Azure resources along the way. We're inviting you to come and enjoy this free learning experience in a series of weekly lessons starting Tuesday, March 8, 2022. We hope to see you there. Hello, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are calling in from. Welcome to this now already fifth, fifth series, uh -huh. like fifth session in this series. So we are halfway through in this 10 series uh, video series. So uh, cool, happy to have you here. Uh, warm welcome. Um, I'm, I'm Hitter, by the way. Uh, I am a customer engineer in the Fast Track for Azure team and um, I help our customers with all things app dev related on the Azure platform. Uh, I'm located out of Belgium and I help with things like AKS clusters, app service, DevOps, GitHub, but also with infrastructure as code. And that is why I'm so excited about Python as a language. And today my co-host, well, you've, you've seen her last week as well, if you uh, are watching the full series, but I'm joined today by Barbara. So uh, if you could please introduce yourself as well. Yes, of course. Hi, I'm Barbara. I am uh, from the Netherlands, uh, calling in here. <clears throat> uh, I work as the Azure technical lead for OGD in the Netherlands. Uh, my focus is on Azure and automation. And uh, yeah, I because I love talking about it so much, I am a Microsoft MVP on the Azure uh, range and as well as a GitHub star. Wow, awesome. Oh, yeah. I want to be a star at GitHub as well. That sounds awesome. <laughs> GitHub great. has the best swag. Absolutely. Ah, no, it's, it's, and it's a I, great tool to work with. <laughs> I need that. I need that swag. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so for the session today, we are also joined by my colleague Joshua. He'll be doing the chat window today. So in case you have any questions, anything goes well, as long as it's related to Bicep and, and to the, the session that we're on today. Uh, but Joshua is there to answer any of your questions that you may have uh, live during the, the show. Um, and also he'll be serving some of these questions to us as well. So we may even answer these questions to you live during the session today. Uh, hi, so, Joshua. Hi, hi, Joshua. So uh, happy to have you here as well. Um, also, in case you want to like uh, learn along while we are going through the session, uh, there is this aka.ms learn live link for you available so that you can actually see the full module we'll be talking about. Uh, you can also follow along with the things we'll be discussing. It might be a bit hard for the exercise yeah. session to follow along because we might be going through it uh, a bit quick uh, to do so, but just keep that link handy or, or scan the QR code that's at the bottom uh, of the screen. Uh, but keep it handy maybe for after the session. It's it's so great to get that hands-on experience and to do this session, do the exercises yourself, try out things, mess around with it, break things or make things, well, preferably make lots of things work uh, on the bicep side. Yeah, yeah even and, if you don't have, a sand, have an Azure subscription, you can use the sandbox. Exactly, really exactly. Awesome. There's this great sandbox environment that has, yeah, pre-prepped stuff available for you and you can just try out all of the commands uh, that are in there. So that's indeed awesome. Um, today's session, it's gonna be about composable bicep files and modules, so composability. So that sounds 
great like it sounds like to me like lego blocks like being able to compose things and to build bigger things right that's is that how i should yeah. kind of understand this yeah i think so it's like uh yeah previously especially with arm templates we're kind of used to like building a house in one template and you want to build your house, your Azure, you want to create your own house in there. But now you can have small blocks that uh, compose of different part of that, that house that you're building or that resource solution that you are building. It really helps with flexibility. Yeah. And actually in Bicep, it's also easier to do that composing of things, like to pull things apart and then to co compose them at a later point in time. Because like in good all good old arm JSON templates. You could also do that and then reference other templates. And it was kind of like a pain, right? I, yeah. You've probably done that as well, Barbara, and it's like, doesn't feel that. I personally refuse <laughs> to use linked <laughs> arm templates because that was that's what we're replacing here, linked arm templates. Yeah, you can do nested arm templates, which is okay, but uh, yeah, not that it, much. But it with, feels, yeah. Kind of icky. <laughs> yeah, and with linked ARM template, you needed to store the ARM template somewhere and then refer to them. And if you wanted to see what was in them, then you had to go to what, wherever they are stored. And you had needed to make them publicly available or you needed to mess around with storage keys. It, just, it was always, let's call it messy. A bit exactly. of a messy experience. Let's, let's keep it between messy and icky and, and agree somewhere <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> okay, cool. So for today so so we're gonna like let you know a, a way of doing the composability in a much much nicer way than how you were used to doing that with arm json templates so i we hope that by the end of the session you'll be able to like design and create those reusable and well structured bicep templates and to actually like yeah compose those multiple modules together to actually create a bigger a bigger whole let's say like yeah and maybe potentially also like less complex if you do that like if you break things apart it becomes less complex yeah right? smaller parts to worry about exactly exactly cool no very keen on learning this one so um let's get started with a small introduction so to actually like see what we what we want to do right um so typically like when you start creating bicep templates. In the beginning, you start small and, and the bicep file is still very manageable, let's say. But when applications and projects start to grow and start to get bigger, yeah, it tends to become more and more unmanageable. And that's that's like, um, yeah, if, if, if you got more stuff in that bicep file, keeping track of what is where is actually a hard thing to do. And that is why that uh, breaking things up in modules and making smaller composable pieces, that's actually what we're what we gonna want to do with modules, right? And one of the benefits that it will also bring is the benefit of reusability. And the benefit of reusability means that suppose I have a big bicep template for my solution A, as you see on the slide, and I break it up in, in my app module, my database module, and my network module that I can actually say, hey, this network module, I need it in this other bicep template for solution B as well, and I can actually reuse it. And that's the big benefit uh, that you get there. Uh, now, Barbara, you, you work at a partner, um, and I, I, I guess you're doing this reusing of modules quite a lot, right? Across yeah. customers maybe even, like, does this really help you as a concept? Yeah, you can uh, almost set up like a database or a registry, as we call it with Bicep, which I think will be uh, part of a later module. Uh, but the thing is, what we know with infrastructure's code, and really any code we work with, is that you don't want to copy code too often. Uh, and we've seen that with stuff like Bicep or uh, ARM templates, that uh, for in this example, that network module, you would have to create it twice if you just had the solution A and solution B template. And maybe there's an error in there somewhere, or maybe you have uh, some uh, company standards that you want to have in there and something changes, then you have to change that in two different ways and uh, in two different templates. You have to change, uh, maybe APIs are updated, you have to change it in two of them. And 
the more you have to change code in separate places, the more chance you have of getting errors in there or making mistakes uh, or even just getting an insistent uh, environment, uh, environment. And that's something I think everyone who works with infrastructure as code on a larger scale is familiar with how do we deal with that? How do we yeah. deal with not copying code, but then again, the, don't have the parameter files become crazy big or crazy complicated. Yeah, exactly. Like the more copies you have, the, the, the harder it becomes to keep track of all of those copies and the harder it becomes to maintain. And the easier it will be to that, that sudden, like subtle errors make it into those templates, right? So yeah, so that composability, that's then actually a great thing for us to get a better view of our bicep templates and to get more like manageable and more maintainable uh, code in there. Now, during this uh, bicep um, uh, session that will, or, or the, the, the full series, you already noticed that, that uh, with Microsoft Learn, we, we love to talk about an example scenario. And you've probably also heard about the toy company and we'll be using throughout this session as well, the same example scenario of the toy company. Uh, now our toy company, they have a new toy out for a wombat apparently, but it's like a very popular wombat toy. And the, the web app that they already have, which is on uh, an app service, um, that web app is actually getting a lot of traffic and because of the popularity of the new toy. Because of that, like end user experience is actually suffering and, and they get like uh, added latency, performance is bad. So the toy company has now decided, hey, let's front that app service with a content delivery network, a CDN. And why? Because with the CDN, they can actually bring the static assets closer to the end user and get a better performance. However, when adding a content delivery network, well, it's good to have that for that production environment, but probably they don't need that for all the environments that they have. They don't need that for their dev. They don't need that for their test environment. They just need it for production. And hence, and that's the thing we're going to try and achieve during uh, this session is, Hence, what they will, will be doing is they will be modularizing the pieces of the bicep template that they already have. Um, they will create a module for the CDN. They will create a module for the rest, <laughs> so to speak, and then decide conditionally whether or not to deploy the CDN on a per environment basis. And that's also what we'll learn then during the session to see, okay, how can you now do this? How can you create a module? How can you consume a module? And how can you do it in a conditional way as well? Because that's the thing, like all the other concepts that you've seen in the previous sessions, you can kind of use them here as well. Like last week, uh, we talked about uh, conditions and loops. I would guess you can use these with modules as well. Right, Barbara? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They can just be a subject of a condition. And uh, yeah, and then this is the end goal that we're going to reach in the final uh, exercise. And then we will know how we can get this with just modules. Awesome, cool. But maybe first, let's take a look at the benefits of modules. So why would you use them? And we've, we've already kind of hint hinted at it. Um, but the thing is, yeah, once you start using bicep templates and, and once they start getting bigger, you tend to feel some pains with those bigger bicep files. And hence, we need to look at uh, the benefits that are there. And one of those benefits, and, and this one we actually kind of already discussed, but one of those benefits is reusability. Yeah, being able to, the modules that you define, to reuse them across, well, even your organization, right? Because yeah. the samples will be showing, what you'll be seeing is that we'll be creating modules in like, well, the same Git repository or like the same folder, let's say, that has your main bicep template. But the thing is with bicep modules, you can actually also share them across your organization, right? Yeah, this is so helpful for if you're working with landing zones and uh, teams are expected to create their own resources, maybe their own applications or their own databases. And uh, then you can help them out, especially if they're first starting within Azure. And they say, yeah, we need this, this, and this resource. And you can say, well, we've got the templates that put them all together and that are already uh, 
uh, according to our company standards. So yeah. it can be very helpful for that. Okay, so and that that means that, like for instance, I could make available for my company like a module that deploys, like let's say, a web app and a database. Like web app backend database would be maybe a good candidate for a module. And then if I have a lot of web apps and databases that are needed for different projects and applications across my company, everybody can just reuse that same template, right? Yeah, and you can always look at what uh, works for you. So what works for your personal company? What resources do you often use combined with each other, for example? Mm -hmm. And you can create one template for that. Yeah, and that, that actually makes a lot of sense. And we've already Dad mentioned it as well. The way you do this with Bicep is actually a lot, lot easier than how you did it with JSON ARM templates, right? With, with JSON ARM templates there, it was a struggle to, well, not only reference them, uh, but also deploy the reference templates together with Bicep. This becomes a lot, a lot easier. Yeah. In, in one of the next sessions that we'll have, we'll also talk about um, template specs and module registries. And there you will actually have, like this, that one will actually go further than what we talk about in this session, but that one will actually help you share those bicep templates or those bicep modules actually across your organization and yeah, get them yeah. org or quite uh, actually, exactly. Um, I see we have a, a question in the chat, uh, which actually is the question, <laughs> what's a bicep? And if she, you're not familiar, I can understand this is a very confusing <laughs> session. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, besides yeah. this, which is a bicep, but yeah. <laughs> bicep is mainly like, like I'll, I'll give a short explanation. And, and based on that, I would definitely advise you to go to the other uh, sessions in this full series, and they will explain to you like from zero, what bicep is and how you can create bicep templates. But like in short, um, Bicep is actually a language that you can use, a templating language that you can use to deploy resources to your Azure environment. Um, and JSON ARM, which we've been mentioning, is actually the like old way of doing that, which was in JSON format. Now we have Bicep format, which is an, a newer language, which gives so much more flexibility. One of which is the module uh, capability. Exactly. And yeah, the, the link to the full series was just in the screen and then uh, I would recommend starting at the first one. And yeah, uh, there, I, would definitely hear, yeah. I would definitely hear advice you start at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then watch this recording like in about five days, do one day per the recording and you'll get that. You'll get that. So, um, cool. So one other thing you can do with modules is you can also encapsulate resources. Meaning that if you need to deploy something to your Azure environment, often it's not just one thing you're deploying. It might be that uh, when you need to deploy, let's say a function app, well, for that function app, you also always need a storage account. And the function app needs some kind of compute to run on, like either it's the consumption plan it's running on or a premium plan it's running on. It needs some kind of compute, like the server farm, uh, we call it on the slide. And it might also be that for the function app, you want to also have a deployment slot where the deployment slot can be used to do zero downtime deployments of new uh, versions of your function app. Now, all those resources actually, they belong together. And what you can do for people in your organization when they need to deploy a function app is actually provide them with a module that encapsulates all those four resources together so they have everything at the ready to be able to deploy. Um, the, 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 the advantage would be that whoever needs to deploy the function app doesn't really need to know the, the full details. They just need to know like, okay, I wanna have a function app and that's the name and then the module just deploys it, which is so much easier in its use. So like, and, and there's like there are multiple others, other resources that you can imagine together, right, Barbara? Yeah, I think the one everyone will be familiar with who just started out with Azure is a virtual machine, which always needs a network interface. So yeah. they can fit perfectly together into one module. 
And that is one that really needs it, but also you could have something that always is the same for your specific application. For example, a web app and a Cosmos database. Maybe you always need one for the, uh, the application that you use. You can combine them both in one module and uh, yeah, make it all a little bit more simple for your company. Yeah. And like, would there be like, so because now we're talking about encapsul encapsulation, do we have like advice that says like, well, you, you should go for encapsul encapsulation or would there also be a, a need or a reason why you would say, well, I have a module and there's just one resource in the module. Would that also be a reason for existence for yeah, the module? Yeah, I, I believe so. The general advice is, advice is to not really invest in m modules that just have one resource in them. I have seen some use cases uh, where it might work. And the most specific one is if you have specific settings in your resources that should always be like this according to your company standards and mostly according to security policies, for example. So maybe uh, you always want to have HTTPS enabled or enforced on a storage account, or you always want to disable TLS uh, 1.0 uh yeah. these kind of things that you can set in one resource and then tell your company hey this is how the storage account should look like <laughs> and then one module with this one resource might make sense yeah that exactly then it then it makes sense right like i'm, I'm also thinking like for instance an aks like an azure kubernetes service cluster which often has like complex configuration and it might yeah. be indeed for your company you're pitting down on one type of configuration for your Kubernetes service, right? For all Kubernetes services across your company. Uh, that's if you're a company with a lot of money and you can afford a lot of Kubernetes services, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Um, no, awesome, awesome. Um, another thing you can do with modules is you can actually compose your modules. So you've already seen in, in previous sessions that it's, it's, it's uh, possible to um, uh, pass on values, let's say, between the resources in one template, you can actually also do that across templates. So what you will get with modules is you'll get your main bicep file and the main bicep file will use uh, or will include actually multiple modules. In this case, on the slide, you see like a, a networking module and a VM module. But the thing is, it might be that the VM module actually needs information about the networking module. And then you can actually use this, like the concepts that you already know around outputs. You can use the output from the networking module to then use that to pass on a value to the VM module. So all of these things you can do and you can actually like mix and match, uh, combine things and uh, like, yeah, get, get, a, get like good building blocks uh, that you can reuse. Uh, and I think Barbara, here is it, it is as well that you can like get some um, uh, like use modules in a repeatable way. Like suppose I say, well, I now have my network resource, but now I need, let's say four VMs in there. So I could use looping and, and things like that, right? Yeah, you can use a loop, loop through like four of these modules and then you can use that subnet resource ID that you got from the first uh module and use it for all four of the new vms so okay. that's actually uh there are in the previous session which you can still view uh, there are some modules used so you can see that you can actually create a for loop without an issue and put a module in there yeah so you were already using modules in the previous session, but... Yeah, and in the previous <laughs> session, we referred to this one to <laughs> explain Go modules. and watch this one so you know <laughs> what we're doing. Okay, so we're cool. Sending you in an infinite loop. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> cool. And like the last benefit we want to point out for, for module usage is that um, yeah, for with, with modules, you can actually also do things with your bicep templates that you can't do without modules. Uh, and one of those things is suppose you have a bicep template where you want to both deploy things at the subscription scoped level, like in your bicep templates, you can define scopes to which you want to deploy certain resources. And suppose you say, well, I have the subscription scope bicep template in there. I want to create a resource group, but as next steps, I also want to create and within that resource group, a web app 
and a database, for instance. And that's where then you can also use a module for the web app and the database, where you actually scope then that module uh, towards the resource group. So that functionality is actually not possible without the usage uh, of modules, right? But I think we've now uh, talked yeah. a lot of concepts <laughs> and like very high level of what, what bicep modules are. I think, Barbara, it's time for a sample, right? To actually yeah. show people what it is and to show them some code in your VS code. So um, let's, let's switch the screen, let's yeah. switch gears. Let's switch what's... over and see what this stuff actually looks like. I mean, the, the theory is nice and I do always love the pictures, <laughs> but uh, yeah, what's that code? Uh, so to show this, I have created here a storage account dot bicep name. Storage account is still one of the greatest uh, demo resources because it's relatively short in code and they are very quick to deploy. So here I have a storage account file and I can deploy this file without any issue. I can just deploy this one and it will create a storage account. Like this, this can... is like a, a normal bicep template. Like I could use yeah. this as a bicep template and which means that then each bicep template is also can function as a module. Exactly. So wow. I don't have to create a separate module file. This is just a bicep template, which I can store uh, use on its own, or I can combine it with other files in one uh, bicep file in one main file. We often call it main.bicep. Mm -hmm. So how that works here, I have my module file. So uh, here I have my main file. I have set up some parameters so I don't have to type them all out because that's pretty boring to watch and I'm probably gonna make a lot of mistakes. So let's just create the modules. And while we're typing, I hope you will see how awesome Visual Studio Code is to do this kind of stuff. Uh, this is just regular Visual Studio code uh, with the bicep uh, extension. And it will auto and complete a lot of stuff for me. So if I want to create a module, I'll type module. And I'll give it a symbolic name. And we're going to do a storage account, which I will call sta, which isn't the best practice. The best practice is to call it storage account. But this is a demo. We're going to be lazy here. And as you can see, I can refer to all the bicep files that are in this folder. And I'm going to create a storage account, the one we created. So I'll tap complete this. And I'll press equals. And here it shows that I can put the required properties in there. So I'll tap complete this again. This is pretty boring because the, all the parameters have a default value in uh, this example, because this is just to show that you can add the storage account here. So, but if, if there's like additional parameters in my storage account module, it will pick them up with the plugin and it will nicely fill them out for me. No issue, no worries. I don't yeah. think JSON templates could ever do this. No, <laughs> I no. did a lot of typing that on those. Yeah, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna see it in a second how it works with some more extensive modules. But this one, yeah, this is a very simple one. So uh, here we have to name the deployment. So the deployment could be a uh, storage account deployment. Seems pretty descriptive. And for this one, that to have just a storage account there, this would be it. So this template will also deploy a storage account, the one that we have here. It's a lot shorter, a lot more readable. And one thing that you can actually do, and I learned this when I did this module, I didn't know this, you can refer to JSON files. You can use JSON files as modules. Which sounds a bit weird because we just spent half an hour talking about how glad or we are with bicep <laughs> and how bad <laughs> json files were but if you have like those good old json files still lying around and you want to reuse them now in your bicep templates you can do so exactly you can create a temporary situation where you know that we have a, in a json file that we haven't converted yet uh and we now we can refer to it so here i have uh, a storage account json oh so much code look how long it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why we don't like JSON anymore. <laughs> so here I'll do start JSON. And it's right at the bottom. And I'll press equals again. And I don't think it will, the required properties for this one, I don't think will actually work. <laughs> but again, this one also doesn't have parameters. 
account that's JSON. And so the, the name that you're typing out, that's actually the name that it will give the deployment of that storage account, right? And we'll see that later yes. on in the session today, like how the deployment, what it looks like. Uh, but yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, we can uh, see this in a second. Let me just check if we should move on for a bit, bit of slides or should we? Yeah, I yeah, think I'll, we have a I'll, few yeah. slides now. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, so that actually really nicely shows how you can like create a module and even use a module inside of your main bicep file or whatever other bicep file that you may have, right? Um, but then the question is, if we have a bicep template, like an existing one, suppose you have an existing one and you say like, okay, I now want to split this one up in separate modules. Like, how do I do this now? How do I get started? How do I know what is connected to what? Then actually a, the tool that can help you out here is, is the bicep visualizer. Uh, so the visualizer, if, if, if you visualize your bicep file with the visualizer, it will show you like blocks and arrows, like you see on, on, the, on the slide. And with those blocks and arrows, you can then actually um, see nicely, and, and you actually see it quite nicely on, on the slide as well, that we kind of have two groups of, of resources uh, on this one. Yeah. So on the one hand, we have like a SQL server with a database and, and transparent uh, data encryption, I think the TDE is. And on the right hand side, you have all the networking resources with like the subnet, virtual network, and so on and so on. And that is like a nice split where you can easily decide, oh, these then actually are two separate modules. Now, this sample is a bit for, well, for learning purposes, of course. Now, in real life, I would actually expect that if, if, if you have a template like this, that actually the database would do some kind of private endpoint kind of stuff inside of your network. So you would still have an arrow between the two of them. And in that case, you could argue, well, if there's only one arrow between resources, it, it might be okay to do a split. And I use output variables uh, to link uh, components together or to link modules uh, together, right? Um, uh, maybe, Barbara, can you maybe show in Visual Studio Code where people can find uh, the visualizer? Uh, maybe we can still do a few slides because I'm okay. going <laughs> to add, add some resources to it okay. first. And then I'll do the visualizer as well. Oh, okay, okay. So you'll show it later on. But uh, just yeah. so we don't forget to show people where they need to click to open the visualizer. So you I hope I won't forget. Because I really <laughs> love tools like that. I mean, uh, yeah, code is awesome. And it's awesome to do it all in code. But this kind of stuff really helps with actually understanding what you're doing. I really like that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like the, the visual stuff, like because like template files can become large quite quickly and, and you might lose the overview and then the visualizer can, can really help you out there, right? Uh, and that's, that's the thing we want to point out. Um, one thing you can also do, by the way, when using modules, you can also uh, nest them. So you can also use modules within modules within modules within modules within modules within modules. <laughs> but we will how far argue. have you tried to go? Yeah, how low can you go? I will actually have settings that's like a limbo. I can limbo. <laughs> but, uh, no, no. So how low can you go with the nesting of modules? We will argue, however, that um, don't make it overly complex. So yeah. it's good to like do like one level of nesting, maybe two levels of nesting, but don't go too deep. Like you still, like the reason for having modules is readability of your bicep templates. And once you, like a user of your bicep module needs to click through and 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 click through, and click through to know what is actually being deployed, that actually uh, lowers the usability of, of the modules uh, that you're writing. So, um, so there, yeah. the huge tip we can give you, readability uh, above complexity. Right. Yeah, um, and the transparency as well. If someone has to click through like five files to actually find out what they are deploying, they might not use your module. They might just think, well, I'm going to write this myself because I have just seen how easy it is to do that with Visual Studio Code. Uh, one thing that can help, because there are reasons for nested uh, modules, and one thing that can help is to have some comments at the top of your main uh, module that refer to what modules are used, including nested modules. 
So then at okay. least when someone uses your main files, they know what files they also need to check out or are also part of the solution. Okay, that's actually a good hint to to know like, okay, what is all being used? Because otherwise people could take your module and just that one file and maybe, yeah. well, I wouldn't then, argue to copy it over to somewhere else, but just keep it all in the same folder structure. It, it will still be able to find it, but then still like indeed readability and understandability of, of what is being done. Uh, it, it will definitely help there. Yeah. And also like um, once you see inside of modules, like that you have like a whole bunch of parameters or a whole bunch of if statements inside of your module, that's also kind of like code smell that you're, not using the module in the right way. Like if, if there's like a lot of if statements inside of a module that's that's nested and nested and nested, that just means yeah. like too many decisions. I have no clue anymore what I'm deploying. And then it's maybe even easier to just create two separate modules and, and, and get rid of all of that if logic uh, because that really doesn't add to the readability, right? Yeah, the important thing is to always be critical. What problem am I solving here? And am I not creating new problems or so solving other ones? <laughs> exactly. Like when I was still a developer, which is way it seems to be way back now, but there was this acronym that they used to tell me tell us, which was like KISS, K-I-S-S, -S, which was keep it simple, stupid. So <laughs> the KISS principle, I still know that one. And now with modules, I actually remembered again another acronym that they they told us, which was the DRY principle, D-R-Y, which is do not repeat yourself which means modularize when it makes sense. And that's yeah. actually the message that we're giving here. So uh, awesome, cool. I'm uh, remembering things from when I was a <laughs> dev. <laughs> um, okay, so using bicep modules, you actually already showed this one uh, in code, um, uh, but uh, like just to uh, recapitulate, uh, to, to repeat what, what, what we did there. So how you use a module, so key there is that you use that module keyword. Um, you then, you give it a symbolic name, like the symbolic name is how you then refer to that module. Yeah, you've seen also in, in previous sessions that when you're deploying resources inside of a bicep template, you can refer to the other resources and, and then uh, they are um, like, they, they um, are dependent on one another. And by doing so, bicep also knows the order in which it needs to deploy things. Uh, so same thing for modules. So if you use that symbolic name, you can refer to that symbolic name. And once you do so, the module will be deployed first before it uh, deploys the other resource that depends on the module. Uh, next, you need the module path. Uh, you've seen that Barbara was using module files all in the same uh, folder. Uh, what I very often see with, with customers when, when they start using modules is that they have some kind of like a modules subfolder and then all the modules go there right um, or you can have some kind of a logical folder structure that if you have a lot of these modules yeah uh, create a structure yeah <laughs> exactly exactly there is by um, the way uh, a question quick question in the mm -hmm. chat what yeah. what what did uh, dry stand for D -R -I. Ah, do not repeat yourself which means that once you start repeating stuff and copying things, you are repeating yourself, which is actually a, a code smell. It's a bad principle when doing code. Once you start repeating yourself in code, like if you do that in code, like C sharp code or, or JavaScript or whatever code, once you see yourself repeating, then you should actually pull out the functionality and create a function for it and then use the function. And the same thing goes for modules. Once you see do yeah. yourself doing the same thing twice in two different bicep templates, you should think like, oh, this could be a module. And you create a module for it and then you use the module in those two bicep files, right? Yeah, I um, think the, the confusing part is that it's like, don't repeat yourself, I think, because I was thinking, ah, yeah. do not Didn't repeat and that N is not in there. Don't, and then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't repeat yourself. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, exactly. Great so D R Y, don't repeat yourself. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Um, next, when you're using the module, you have that name property. So the name property, and, and Barbara will show that once we start deploying uh, the bicep templates. So the name property actually defines and or specifies the name of your deployment. Um, and the thing is, and, and that's what you'll see, is that you'll actually, when you have a main bicep template and then the module being used, 
that in Azure, you'll actually end up with two deployments, one for the main template and one for the module that you're deploying. And there, that name property will be used. And then lastly, you also have the params property. I don't think we've seen that one in VS Code yet because you had default values everywhere, but I think we will have a sample of that coming up where you're using parameters, right? Uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to show that now or we do some more slides? <laughs> Uh, we can actually, well, I can show some stuff now and I'm going to move forward with some stuff that will explain the slides then. Yeah. Okay, Let's, cool. Uh, move and then I, I do, code. I do repeat in the slides and yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll be flexible about this. Excellent. <laughs> that was the point. We're going to be flexible with everything. Yeah. So, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah, so with my have... mind, I am flexible, but not with any other limbs or but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> not with your biceps. <laughs> so um, here we have uh, those modules that we already created. So the storage count ones, pretty boring. There are not even parameters in there. Let's see how we can work with parameters. And to do that, we have app.bicep, which I have over here. So this one has some parameters here an app service, app name, an environment type, location, again, is uh, uh, hard-coded or has a default value, I should say. And what this does, it deploys a site and a server farm, or as we also call it, a web app and an app service, which have different resources names. So that's yeah, it's like, like used web, to. App, web app app service plan. Uh, that's yeah. like, yeah, you, you hear those different namings, right? And yeah, it we seems call like server yeah. farms and sites. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> like I think the like Azure Resource Manager resource provider for web apps uh, got created way back, and they, yeah. it still has that old naming in it. While like in in Docs, you'll see app service plan and and, and web app. While it's actually yeah, what what is it like server farm and sites? Meh. Uh, you need to get used yeah. to that one. In case, by the way, you're wondering what things are called, um, I would definitely recommend that you do a Google search for um, uh, Azure Resource Manager template reference. So look for that one. And that yeah. actually brings you to the full template reference. And, and you can actually check out how things should be called in your bicep templates. But uh, sorry, I'm diverting yes. from your sample. <laughs> These are resources that are often used together. So this makes sense to have this be one uh, module instead, instead of just one resource in a module. So let's refer to that one. And what we'll do is use a module and then a module as a symbolic name. And I can pick the file that I wanted to use, which was app.bicep. And ask again, give me the required properties. And here we have parameters in there. So it says it needs an app service name and uh, an app service app name, I must say, and an environment type. And these are parameters over here. So I can say uh, app service name and environment type. So I can move on to the uh, to the parameters I already have here. So if someone now deploys this module, it can give those parameters and it will be passed on into this one. So it will be one whole thing. I need to give this a name. So like, suppose that, that, that like based on um, uh, the parameters I pass through, I need to take some some kind of business decisions on how to deploy something. Do we have some kind of guidance like where it's best to put those business decisions? Would it be rather than in the module file or would it rather be in the main bicep file? Overall, I would think you want the main bicep file or the, the module files to be very flexible. And mm -hmm. it, it can be it can be complicated because you can decide, well, I'm gonna put everything in a parameter. And then it's flexible, not but not very usable because it gets confusing mm -hmm. to put parameters in there. So what I over, overall would advise is to make the check with these module files, where do I actually need flexibility? What mm -hmm. values do actually change within my environment? Like the environment might change, but maybe everything has the same skew. It's not a resource, mm -hmm. not a use case I see a lot, but it could happen. So think of all those parameters, like, do I actually need to change it 
this as one time or another. Okay. So if we have those uh, things here, because we talked about that visualizer. So now we have four different resources in here. Well, one of them is in a module. And I can press right and see open visualizer and to the side, but I'll open it dedicated here. Mm -hmm. Good thing that you remember to visualize because I had already yeah. forgot about it. So good, <laughs> good one. <laughs> so, and here it says, here is the app module, which has two applications in there that are connected with each other. And here it has the storage account, which has the storage account. And if something else was in there, it would also show that it was connected. And yeah, okay, we'll forgive this one. He has no <laughs> idea what to do with that JSON file. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes sense. It's, this is a it's, our, it's already thinking, let's just forget about Jason. That, that, yeah, that <laughs> should, that's a good idea. So, but this can help with visualizing stuff mm -hmm. and seeing, yeah, they're not connected to each other. They, they're not connected at all. But here we can see, uh, and with the visualizer, we can see what is in the module, which is really helpful if you have a lot of modules in your yeah, main yeah. .bicep file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a real help to like indeed see it visually and, and it actually even very neatly placed it and and the the different yeah. connections on the screen like i've seen worse visualizations for edge absolutely <laughs> this is really nice now uh what we can do uh with this file that we have now is uh we can deploy this directly to azure uh, but we can also look at what the JSON would look like, because this is generating an ARM template in the background. So what would that ARM template look like? And while we don't want to think about ARM templates anymore, it is good to have some idea of what structure you are creating, because that can help you if you have to troubleshoot something. Yeah, because in the end, it's still the JSON that gets sent to the resource manager, uh, like the resource provider plane in Azure, right? It's not the bicep template, but it's actually a transpilation that always happens, and it's always the JSON file that that uh, Azure receives, right? Yeah, the good thing is you can deny it because you don't have to watch it, but yeah, uh, yeah in the background it does happen, and yeah. it can be helpful to understand what's going on, and to do that you can build the BICEP file. Uh, you can do that with the two versions of BICEP, which is uh, AZ BICEP, which is part of the AZ CLI, or with BICEP, the dedicated module, which both for some reason have a different syntax. Uh, these two commandlets do exactly the same. And if I run this one now, it will start running down here. It will probably give a warning uh, somewhere. Because, yeah, I have a parameter that is not according to best practices, mm -hmm. but we'll just ignore that. We'll know what mm -hmm. it needs to know. And it will create a JSON file here. And this is the JSON file that will be deployed. And what's a good thing to see is that um, what it does, it creates deployments. So basically, this is a whole bunch of nested templates within our original templates. Without us needing to worry about uploading those nested templates to a storage account using a SAS token, like a security access something token. I don't even know exactly. what SAS stands for, but it's like a token thing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. We can uh, let Bicep create those files. And this is a file that is pretty unreadable as, while we're watching Bicep. It's like, well, there's so much information, but we don't have to worry about it. And here we have the deployment for the application. And this one has the two resources, the web app and the application services. OK, cool. We also have a question in chat uh, where the question is, like, if we would recommend using Bicep as well as the main way to deploy compiled function apps. So and I'm understanding that as not only the resource, like the function app resource, but also the code bits that need to deploy into the function app, like would we also recommend Bicep for deploying that? Um, maybe you want to answer that one first, Barbara. Yeah, but personally, I, I separate them. Uh, I do the deployment in Bicep of the function itself. And then um, usually I like to use uh, something like uh, Azure DevOps pipelines or GitHub Actions to deploy the actual code to the function. Yeah. 
to the deploy the, the compiled yeah. code, right? And yeah. yeah, likewise. And and for function apps, it actually works even better if you uh, zip all of that together, like you compile and you zip it all together. That will actually speed up your uh, startup time uh, for your function app. Um, and I, yeah, I would also go for a two-step process. Like uh, the infrastructure is something else than the code that goes within the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Same goes for, yeah. let's say, well, I'll, I'll go back to an AKS cluster, like an Azure Kubernetes service cluster. The cluster itself, the deployment of that is ISAP code, but then the containers that need to run on that, that's a separate deployment of YAML files. Uh, so yeah, and you pull can, it apart. You can put them in the same repository for trans transparency, or you use a registr registry, something like that. But uh, the pipelines to actually deploy them are often two separate pipelines. Exactly. Because very often, like the um, the life cycle that you need on the infrastructure is different than the life cycle you need on the code. The exactly. infrastructure life cycle is much more long lived and, and needs lesser changes, especially once you become like you get to some kind of a stable point while the code keeps on being iterated upon and, and you want to keep that separate, right? Yeah. Oh. Uh, let's see, should we? Let's, should Can we, we also deploy maybe, this? Yeah, yeah. Let's, um, let's, we've been writing templates, but we have no idea whether they actually deploy. Let's deploy <laughs> but, all but the they things. they do, I know. Yeah. <laughs> deploy all the things. Cool. <laughs> yes, I have uh, created uh, uh, some PowerShell to deploy this. Um, this, uh, If you do the exercise, you will do this as well, and it will connect and do all those things. But I have already connected to... Um, my Azure tenant. And what I would do here is first I create that new resource group. And this one I can run over and over again because I used the force uh, parameter, little tip. Then it will just check if it's there and uh, create it if it's not there. Or it will try to create it, but it's already there. So uh, yeah, you can run this over and over. And I have the parameters here. Uh, that you would use in new AZ resource group deployment. So you'd give it a name, and then I refer to that template file, which was a module, uh, which uses those modules. And then I have a resource group name and the app service na app name, because that was one of the only parameters that was not set uh, in the file itself. Yeah, and, and just pointing out, because I, I think that was a, a great tip that you gave last week in the session as well, is on, I, I think it's with the ads syntax, right? Splitting. To properly get that PowerShell parameter stuff in there. Yeah. I'm, I'm not into PowerShell. I do everything with AZCLI, so I knew nothing oh, about this. So I was like, oh, great tip. I, I will still not use it because I don't do PowerShell. I do AZCLI, but... <laughs> No, PowerShell, PowerShell, no, <laughs> I'm a PowerShell user. And what you often see in those examples is they use backticks to make it readable, to put it on different lines. But backticks are very easy to miss. They're very easy to not see them and not fully understand what's going on. So with the PowerShell, what we have adopted for a while now is using splatting. So here is basically a hash table with this information and you can refer to it when you use uh, the commandlet with the at sign instead of uh, a dollar sign so here's the dollar sign it's a variable and with add you can refer to it this also makes it very flexible because if i want to change uh, i'll load it first but if i want to change uh, for example the resource group name i can do it like that yeah, and that's so flexible, so, so yeah. flexible. I really like that approach. Well, this is not something I don't think you can even do in AZCLI, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is even better. And and maybe yeah. also pointing out that uh, I think it's online. It's a bit small here for me because I have a small window. Uh, but uh, online 19, that you're actually naming the deployments based on like when you're deploying this, like you do the get data. Uh, so, so in your deployment name, you will always get a unique name for each and every deployment, right? Yeah, and the, the thing is, if you don't do that, uh, then it will overwrite the previous deployment mm -hmm. with the same yeah. name. And I have seen some inconsistency in the past. I have seen that deployments did not go through, especially when using pipelines, because there was already a deployment with, a different, with the same name. It shouldn't mm -hmm. happen, but I've seen it happen. Okay. So... For security, I 
always like to add uh, this string, which will take the current date up to the second. So it's mm -hmm. most of the times it's unique. Yeah. So yeah, what I always or sometimes also use in in like pipelines or GitHub Actions is like, for instance, the run number or uh, yeah. so that would also work, right? And then you can even link it back to the actual uh, pipeline run that you had for this deployment. So then you can exactly. see something something went wrong. Oh, this is where I need to look. So then you can link it back. Uh, yeah, that works good, good very thing. well. Now I could run this. Uh, but there, are, I'm going to show you in a second why I'm not going to run it now. Uh, one reason is that uh, this is going to take a long time. So that's uh, we're not going to wait for that, wait for that to happen. And last week we compared this to a cooking show where we put the cake in the oven and then say, well, we have a ready made cake, cake right here. <laughs> so I did that actually uh, in my Azure portal. Oh, so... look, ready made cake. Cool. <laughs> Here it is, here we have uh, our storage accounts, uh, app service plan and uh, the app service itself. So these have been deployed and now we can look at the deployments over here. And we can see that it has created multiple deployments. And this is the reason I'm actually not running it at this time is as you see, uh, the main deployment has that name that I just configured with a timestamp. But these deployments do not have them. So if I run this again, it will overwrite that history. So that's the reason why I didn't deploy it this time. And can I? Can you actually vary that name? Like you could take some kind of a parameter to vary. Yeah, and uh, name, you right? also have uh, UTC now as a function within mm, okay. Bicep. So if you really want everyone to be unique, you can uh, do that in the deployment name. Okay. But here we had the main deployment, uh, which is the main file, what it was running. And here we have the separate deployments for the My App deployment, which was the module with the app service and the app service plan. And the two storage accounts both have their own deployment name. Okay, cool. So That's very, awesome. uh, very visible to see uh, how that works. Perfect. Um, anything else we want to show in this module, or I think we can go back no. to slides, this is right? The one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just going to repeat with a slide just very briefly what, what uh, Barbara was just showing is if you have your main bicep file, you have your deployment, it's the deployment name or the name that you use for the module that will be used as your deployment name. So you saw that very, very nicely in the sample that we showed. Um, yeah, I think we gave all the explanation that I was to give on that. Um, Barbara also showed how you can transpile your bicep files uh, to actually get them that JSON file and to have an insight in, in what is that. Now, one of the things you also saw in the demo was uh, that Barbara got this, this warning. Um, and that's actually because of the bicep linter uh, kicking in, right? Uh, so bicep also has a linter that can tell you if there's any errors uh, in your uh, bicep files. Uh, you can also configure the linter. I'm actually not sure whether we already had a session on that one, uh, but might be it's coming up in, in case it, it wasn't part of the previous uh, sessions that we did in the seri series. The linter, by the way, also very nice in, in Visual Studio Code, by the way. If you see the red squiggly lines in VS Code, that's also the linter uh, that is giving you those those outputs or those red squiggly lines. So uh, that's awesome as well. Cool. Um, so on the parameters, uh, this we also already showed uh, in the um, in the sample. Uh, so you can very easily use parameters in your modules same way as you do in a main template file. Um, yeah, <laughs> there's no biggie on this one. Um, no, no rocket science. Uh, you just use a parameter. One tip is use good naming for your uh, parameters. Uh, the description can help as well, of course, but good naming is, is like a rule of thumb there. Um, we made a small note to ourselves for the slice where we said we should actually come up with a better like example of good parameter naming because we kind of both agreed that this wasn't the best sample, but anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this works. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like, what you saw with my uh, symbolic names. I often use sta for my demos because it's shorter, but it's not the best practice. If you do this in production, just type out storage account, for example. Yeah. Don't be afraid to create long parameters or long uh, symbolic names. 
Exactly. Just make sure that they tell what they do, right? That that's that's the rule of thumb there. Yeah. Um, one of the things you can also do with um, with modules is you can also use conditions on them. So either yes or no, deploy the module, or within the module, well, you can use um, uh, uh, the conditions there as well. Suppose, for instance, you have like a Cosmos DB uh, that you need to deploy. And uh, based on the environment you deploy it to, you want to yes or no link it to a log analytics workspace uh, with conditions you can actually then do so. Yeah, so um, that is something you can use that as well. And then the module outputs, um, yeah, module out outputs, they will be picked up by the main module. And then you can actually send them on to a next module, for instance, or use them in the main module. One big, um, uh, shout out there uh, to be very, very um, uh, careful there in case you have secret values. So in case you have secret values in your module file, do not send that back as an output to the main module. Uh, why not? Because those secret values, they will actually show up. Uh, so um, you will see them in logs. Uh, a better option would be if you have a secret value. So for instance, you create a uh, Cosmos DB and it needs to use a password. Put those values then in a key vault uh, that you reference inside of the module. And then um, any other uh, components in your full architecture can then use those values from the key vault to then connect to the Cosmos DB database. And if you do that, nobody sees the in-flight uh, secrets uh, floating around inside of your logs or inside of your, uh, yeah, inside of your code even. Uh, so, so that's a rule of thumb uh, on, on the secret stuff as well. Um, and in case you, by the way, you have other values that are not secret, uh, there's another service in Azure, which is Azure App Configuration. That one you can also use to store like these type of configuration values that are not secret values. So if it's secrets, Key Vault is a service to go for. If it's not secret, it's, it's Azure App Configuration that you may want to use there. Um, cool. And this is actually an image that you've already you've already seen passing <laughs> the output along. But I think like I think we're gonna switch to the exercise uh, now, and that is where you will actually see this uh, in action. Um, yeah. So what, what I think I'm gonna do is I'm mm -hmm. gonna take some time to show both conditions. Mm -hmm. and uh, the output, and then see how long that takes and maybe give people a chance to do the exercise themselves. Okay. But uh, let's just get practical in uh, first those conditions we talked about, because conditions are a little bit different uh, within uh, when you're using a module. Not that much. Um, but let's say over here, let me just grab all the code that I needed. Uh, yeah, this is the one. So here I have the code for a Cosmos database and I uh, intend to use this uh, as a module for another file. But what I want to do is create a Cosmos database account. And then if I go below here, I want to create diagnostic settings. But I only want to create diagnostic settings if I also have a log analytics ID. And I have set that in a parameter here. So here it says, if a log, log analytics workspace ID is defined, then the Cosmos DTB, DB account diagnostics are deployed. And I'll just set this to small. And if I look over here, here I have set that condition. And yeah, just a little bit zoomed in too much. And what it says, if the log analytics workspace ID is not zero, or is not an empty string, you should call this, then it will deploy this. And I set a default value here of exactly that value. That means if no log analytics workspace ID uh, is defined, then it will not deploy that one. And that's one thing you have to add when you do this within a module. So if I would refer to this in a module right here, uh, here I have a log analytics workspace, which I have already created. And I would go uh, with module and then uh, this would be a Cosmos DB. And I would refer to the Cosmos DB. 
uh, add the required properties, uh, Cosmos DB deployment, and then I can set the parameters. And I have the location in the workspace ID, which I can use. Location would be location, just to get rid of any errors. And now I can set the log analytics workspace ID and use the reference to that other resource. Oh. An ID. So because I have set this one up, it would create those diagnostic settings. But if I just leave this empty, if I leave this out, then it will not create those because it's by default set to that empty string, which says, yeah, not do not deploy this thing. So, so then I you you would be able to like if you have a production deployment for Cosmos DB, you would definitely want to lock things out. But if you have like a dev environment, maybe, or a test environment, you may not want to do that, right? Yeah. So I might set it up like this. And uh, this also shows you it can combine resources and modules if that fits your use hmm. case. So that's a little bit about those conditions. <clears throat> it's almost the same if, if, as if there was no module involved. But this one, the is and then an empty string, is actually really powerful with modules. Uh, me, myself, I also use it a lot with tags. If I uh, define tags like this, this and pass them on, and if no tags are passed on when the deployment is done, uh, then it will just not create any tags. So another example where you can use this. Now that output that we uh, talked about, create and use the output from one of the files and use them in another one. Uh, here I have a storage account with a storage container, uh, blob service storage can container. And this storage account has the blob container resource ID. So it's the resource ID of this container uh, defined as an output in the module. And here I have a referral to that module, so a storage account, uh, a storage container. And I can use that, and I'll just put it in a var to have something to uh, show how it works. Uh, container ID, and I would say storage container. And if I press a dot, I get the, the option to use the name, which will be the name of the deployment, or I can use the outputs that were created. So if I tap complete that, then it will show the outputs that are available. You can have multiple uh, outputs available right here. So now I can have a blob container resource ID. So the the the, um, uh, the auto completion on this, like the intelligence on this, is is really really nice. That's, so helpful. I really really li like that. And like and if you would do this, like this storage container dot output dot blob container resource ID, if you would use that now in another resource in this same uh, bicep template file, bicep would actually know. Oh, I need to first create the storage container and only then create that other resource. So like it depends on and all those things, it will also here figure it out for you, right? Yeah, you don't it will do know there's, it. there's a dependency in here. Although that can be a bit iffy with modules. So do be careful with that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it goes wrong, but most of the time you don't have to actually define that something depends on something else as long as you refer them to each other. And I have an example of that as well. Uh, because here I have a virtual network um, and a virtual machine. And this is an example we uh, talked about before. <laughs> so here is the virtual network. This is really basic, not flexible at all. It's just to make a point. So very, I have, very hard coded. <laughs> yeah, this is bad. For demo, for demo purposes, we made it very hard coded. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't copy any of this. <laughs> But here we have a virtual network, and then here we have subnet, and I've created an output here that said subnet resource ID. So it will use the ID of this specific subnet. And here I have a virtual machine, which was also one of the examples we talked about. This one has a resource, which is a virtual machine, and it was has a network interface, because these two are always combined with each other. And I've added subnet resource ID as a parameter here, which is used to define where that network interface should connect to on the private network. And if I go back to the module file that I was actually using, here I have the module virtual network. And I've already set this all up because we see now how you can do that. 
And here I have the module virtual machine. And here it needs that resource ID. So what I can do is refer to virtual network, which is right up there, and then use outputs. And then again, here I have that subnet resource ID. So now I don't have to define it anywhere. I don't have to go resource ID and then bracket and uh, all this difficult kind of stuff that we need to do with ARM templates. This is enough. It will now understand that it needs the subnet ID that it got from the previous module. Okay, awesome. And I think that concludes this sample on the conditions yeah. and the outputs. And yeah, I think indeed we will need to skip the, um, uh, the actual exercise. Uh, but one thing uh, before we go to the knowledge check, I think is is very very nice to point out as well is uh, Barbara, you actually you have a in your Git repository a very nice example of using a module as well, right? Which is yeah. on the naming conventions. Uh, so maybe you can show that quickly yeah, in, if, your, in your browser. Yeah. If we move back to uh, my screen real quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll remove this, by the way. Uh, because yeah, the exercise, you can do it on your own. It's a lot of fun to actually do it yourself. So we'll leave that uh, up to you. You can do it in the module. Uh, here I have an example module and I thought I made it a little bit shorter. Yeah, I did. So I think every company knows the issue of naming conventions. You want a consistent naming convention, have everything be consistent so you can easily see what a resource is and what it belongs to. It can be very hard to get that consistency. It's easily to make errors in something. And uh, yeah, that gives some noise. And if uh, something has a name, then you cannot change it that easily. You would have to redeploy it. So what I created was an, uh, uh, a module that doesn't actually uh, deploy anything. It just uh, creates uh, some uh, variables that you can use. It creates some outputs that you can use. So in this example, it uh, asks for a team name. So the name of the team that will be using the resource, uh, the environment, uh, the function of the resource, what it's used for, and an index number. So that's uh, one of the use cases I see a lot. And I actually, I took this down a bit. This is quite a simplified version. There is a bigger version that I have created on my blog. And uh, what it does, does is it creates the resource name with all those values. So here it combines the team name, environment letter, and the function. You don't have to worry about all those kind of stuff. Uh, it has a placeholder in here, but also, for example, the storage account name. Everyone knows that a storage <laughs> account, if you deploy don't the more the than dashes once, in that. no yeah. dashes, no <laughs> capitalization, nothing fun. Everything needs to be low and <laughs> low and, and behold. Each other. <laughs> And, oh, and uh, no more than 24 uh, uh, signs, stuff like that, characters. Uh, this one isn't that correct because I took a lot of stuff out uh, to uh, make this a little bit uh, read more readable. But it would create that storage account name and that resource name that you could use for all your resources and then creates an output for that. Yeah. And so what, how what you we will... yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, how you <laughs> could use this is over here, I have that module. So here I have a module naming convention that I have loaded into this. And as you see, I can tell here, it is for production. Uh, the function is a website. The team that uses the infra team and the index number is one. And how you could use that, and I'm just gonna copy and paste this real quickly. Uh, you could use this name as the name of resources for other modules that you're using here. But to make a point of what it's actually doing, I will create an output. So I can show this uh, real quickly. And that's this one. So uh, did I change the name? Yeah. And I think this is the one. So this doesn't actually deploy anything. This is just to show that it creates an output. But what I would do in practice is I could use modules and use this thing to set the name of the storage account that I might deploy. The deployments take long. So, uh, and this one shouldn't, but it is a demo. So you never know. <laughs> like I said, it's not actually deploying anything. Uh, yeah, but here we have the output and we see the storage account name that it has created. 
If you would have to do this manually for every team, uh, how big is the chance that you have an error somewhere in there or a typo? So this can really help with having the uh, storage account be created for yeah. you. And you, you actually get consistent naming as well across all of your like resources that you will deploy. Uh, the yeah. thing what we'll, we will do is in the in the chat window for people on, on the live session, we will actually put the link to uh, Barbara's um, sample uh, repository. Uh, we will put that in the chat window for your reference as well. And we might also be able to put it up in the banner thingy uh, for the live session so you can actually refer to it. It's actually a great example of using a module a bit out of sync with what we've been showing today, but but still yeah. a very, very usable one. Like I've known, I, I also do Terraform from time to time, and, and that is actually a naming convention module or multiple even in, in the Terraform world. Uh, and it's great that we can do this in Bicep as well. So uh, there we go. Absolutely. Uh, that is the link to uh, where you need to be to grab grab that code and start using it. Even fork it and contribute, it's open source and everything. So uh, yeah. cool. <laughs> How about we check our knowledge? Yes. We have 15 minutes left, I think. So uh, let's check our knowledge and uh, let's see what people have learned. Um, yeah. First thing on the knowledge check. So, um, uh, and if you want to follow along and uh, let me maybe uh, bring this one up, uh, then you can already go to the link uh, where, um, uh, where the poll is. So we have a poll on aka.ms slash polls. Um, and you can actually vote on your favorite answer uh, to this question. And the question is actually, you have uh, the main bicep file that you saw on the previous slide, but we have this nice morph action now on this slide. So you can see, actually see the main.bicep file, yay. <laughs> so you have this main.bicep file um, and you also have a store.bicep file. Um, and you now wanna deploy these two, you wanna, well, you wanna deploy the main.bicep file. And the question is, if you look at the um, uh, the deployment history now for your main.bicep file in your Azure portal, what will you see? Yeah, Will you see a single deployment named main? Or will you see option B, two deployments, where the first one is named main and the other one is called storage one? Or will you see two deployments, option C, where the one is named main and the other one is named my storage? So. Let's get people a little time for votes uh, coming in. Uh, yeah, you can maybe... vote at that link. It's not that busy yet. So, uh... no, we're not seeing. Ah, I see one vote coming in, which is. Yeah, maybe might we... not be the correct one. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's take a look at the, at the answer option. So, Barbara, what do you think? Like, uh, let's say option, a. like, first of all, what do you think? Yeah. Will we see one deployment well, or two deployments? Yeah, what I always like with uh, the questions uh, is that sometimes you see, yeah, uh, we can see the difference uh, with the questions and usually one uh, answer you can tell, yeah, might not be it. And we did see this uh, before, but we didn't it did see do the exercise, so you only saw it once. But if you looked really quickly at when we were deploying this in the Azure portal, uh, you would have seen that it made separate several deployments. Because if you deploy something through a module, uh, it will create the main deployment and then another one for, for every the module. module that you deploy. It will create a separate uh, deployment. Yeah. And so the then thing is, yeah, it's it's so important it's to know. C. Yeah, it's important to know for troubleshooting because overall functionality doesn't change. It also always deploys the same resources, but for troubleshooting, it's very useful to know. And then the question is, if we look at B and C, then uh, B uses the name, the symbolic name of the module, while uh, C uses the name that is defined as the name of the deployment. Yeah, I kind of yeah, gave it away here. Me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the storage one, that thing is always a symbolic name. And so that is how you refer to that module in the rest of the main bicep file, but it will not be the name that the deployment will get. Like the name for the deployment will be the value of the name parameter, right? Which is then my storage. So, couple, like, at least one person got this wrong. I uh, got this right. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it is actually answer option uh, C. So you get two deployments. The first one is main. So uh, 
a lot of people were for the two deployments, but there was some um, some difference on what the name of the second deployment would be. Uh, but it's going to be storage, uh, my storage uh, for the second uh, deployment. Yeah. Cool. Let's go to the next question. So the second question is, you plan to update that main.bison file and you want to add another resource. Uh, the new resource, it needs, the, uh, it needs access to the key of the storage account created in the module. What should you do? So you create a storage account. The storage account has a key, which is typically a secret value. You don't want to share that. So how should you use now that secret value? Should you A, create an output in the storage module and set its value to the storage account's connection string to that secret value? Should you B, use a key vault and then put the connection string as a secret inside of the key vault or C, you shouldn't do anything like the properties for all the resources. They are just magically available to the parent <laughs> template. So for that second uh, question, what do you think? Would it be A, B, or C? Like C, I would think that would be very handy. Like, you yeah, yeah do I'm, I'm like always lazy. for <laughs> not doing anything. <laughs> But, but yeah, I don't think that's the that's the the answer, right? <laughs> no, we wouldn't have a job if we uh, did it like that. Now you do need to do something, and you wouldn't want your uh, stuff to always be available because then your main template would become very confusing uh, with everything yeah. on the background and for troubleshooting. Uh, exactly. But then again, for this one, uh, the tricky thing is that there are two things that work, which we could say now is A and B, but there is a best practice here. Exactly. That uh, you should follow. So it doesn't say what should you do to make it work, but what should you do to do it right? And yeah, I think uh, when we see the two options and we know there's a best practice and we see uh, a key fault anywhere, then often the answer is key fault. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is always key vault. If you, if you see secret in a, in a question, then you should always answer key vault. So indeed, like the, 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 uh, the correct answer here is indeed uh, B. Uh, you should use a key vault to store the secret in the key vault. Uh, the reason why A is not the correct answer is if you pass that secret value through the output of the module, it will actually be uh, visible um, inside of that, uh, well, inside of your logs for your uh, module deployment, which is yeah. not something that you want. Don't uh, want that. Uh, you need secrets, you want to keep them secret. Exactly, exactly. And I think we can, well, we can still do yeah, this. We can do this really quickly. This, okay. this is doable. <laughs> this one is doable. Okay, cool. You start so, folding now. We're going to go fast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a large bicep file and you want to decompose it into modules and you want to identify the resources that should be defined together in each module. Which tool should you, should you use for that? Should that be A, the bicep visualizer, B, the bicep linter, or C, the Azure documentation for ARM templates? We actually mentioned all three during the session, um, yeah. but um, so just just to speed up a bit, we'll, we'll go straight maybe to the right answer. And, and the right answer here to this question is actually the bicep visualizer. So the bicep yeah. visualizer will help you see what components are in there and how you can split up the modules. The bicep is also a great tool to use, but that is for like sanity checking your bicep templates for seeing if everything is okay and deployable. Um, and the ARM documentation, that's just a great thing, documentation to have lying around, uh, but that will not help you figure out which modules you need. So, uh, and nope. all the cool. ARM template documentation by default goes to the bicep document, uh, documentation. Exactly. Our exactly same pages. Exactly. So, yeah. It's all at the same place. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and plus in the ARM documentation, there's also, if you scroll all the way to the bottom for a resource, you have sample templates, which is totally awesome to see how you can build your template, what it can look like, how you can use the resources together. Uh, so that's a great resource to look at, but it's not the answer to this question. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So we are going to wrap up here. Um, I hope you had a great, great, uh, you found it a great, great session. Uh, and we hope you, you learned how to design um, uh, those bicep modules and how to create them in a reusable and well-structured way. Uh, we also hope that you learned how to use those multiple modules together and get like a Lego block approach and like go small on the modules and then compose them into bigger parts to actually get uh, some good, good uh, infrastructure deployments on the Azure platform.
Um, I'm just going to point out again uh, the link for this li uh, live session again. So if you want to do that, that exercise that we skipped, I definitely recommend you go to that learn module, uh, do the hands on stuff, try it out. Uh, you have there the sandbox environment that can help you in case you don't have an Azure environment of your own. Um, but do the hands on stuff. You will greatly, greatly learn uh, lots of stuff by doing this yourself. Um, and well, this is actually part of a 10 part series this session so and we are at five now we are in the middle but more good sessions coming up so we have one next week which is on uh, child and extension resources i actually know squat about those well i i might you know some <laughs> stuff on those but not too much so i am gonna tune in uh, yep. you'll find me in the audience next week um and yeah don't hesitate to shout out to us uh I, I found this an awesome, awesome experience. Great session. Yeah, and, uh, this was a lot of fun. Exactly, exactly. And, and yeah, modules, one of the greatest features, I keep saying, of Bicep. Really, exactly. this really helps you out. So Exactly. We go for reuse. So uh, awesome. Yeah. Everyone, it was great having you. See you on the next session. And bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> See ya.